Front Row MMA, we're here with Mark Woodon, who is uh, one of the country's leading MMA officials and has been for years. Um, Mark, you're one of the sort of unsung heroes in MMA, if we're honest, and we know you've been involved for gone 20 years. Can you tell us how you got started in martial arts and how that transitioned to MMA? Um, I'm asthmatic. Um, I used to swim, got bored with that because back in 50 years ago it was exercise rather than uh, drug controlled. Uh, so they, they advocated exercise. I used to go swimming three times a week, got bored with it. My mum found a local judo club. I started with that and the rest is history. It's just gone on from there really. So how did you make the, how do you make the transition from, from judo player you know, someone who's training into the, the, the world of the official, which is <clears throat> where you are now. I had a, a successful um, kickboxing, Thai boxing gym. Um, we trained 27 champions out of there. Uh, I went on a judges and referees course because as a trainer I needed to know the rules and how the mindset of the referee and the judge so as you know my fighters we could we could translate that into their training and the way that they fought um, part of that was doing practical so then it became you were judging a couple and you refed a couple uh, then I got asked to go and judge on a show in Bethnal Green I turned up there to judge. I was really, really happy because I was only meant to be judging the undercard. Um, the undercard, the lowest fight was, uh, the most junior fight was a British title. And I was going to judge a British title and a European and Commonwealth title. There were four world titles on that night, as I remember. Um, the referee who was supposed to be doing it didn't turn up. I was the only qualified referee, so they threw me in at the deep end and I ended up refereeing 15 title fights. And I absolutely pooed myself. Bethnal Green, loads of big names in the kickboxing, title boxing world, got through it with a breeze and from then it went on and then when MMA started, because uh, I, I was quite, I'd worked and, and trained with um, Dale Adams. Dale asked me if I would get involved in referee Ultimate Combat, which I did, and from there it just spiraled. And you found the evolution between the more traditional combat sports, the kickboxing and the boxing, to MMA. Was that an easy transition to make? Um, <clears throat> it, yes. Yeah, it was. I mean, you know, I believe that that gave me a really good grounding, as in when a fight's hurt and when a fight's not hurt. Going back to how you got into it yourself, you said, you know, um, you went on a course, you then were slowly ushered into it. Do you think that's still something which should be more packed today as more people come into the sport, more people come to officiating? Yes, without a doubt. Yes, 100%. This, this country, in my opinion, it's only my opinion, needs a recognised training schedule for people who want to officiate. Because it is an extremely aggressive sport, it's an extremely um, violent sport, but the people who do it are competitors, they're not aggressive people, they're not violent people, it is just the nature of the sport and I believe that the officials need to be trained so as we have control over that. It worries me that I go to shows or I see shows and there are people there who I've never seen before and obviously have no idea what is occurring in that that arena. Yeah. And that and that worries me. Well in February 2000 this year uh, obviously with the USC in Sweden the Swedish government body have set up the IWMAF. Yes. Is that a positive step for MMA? Do absolutely, absolutely. Anything that is going to regulate this sport and make this sport safer for everybody involved. Listen, we've got some of the best officials in the world in this country, but we can't be everywhere. I say we, but those guys can't be everywhere. And what worries me is, is that we've got so many promoters who don't really understand the sport, who don't know what they're doing. They just think, you know what, I, I've got 10 grand, 15 grand, I'm going to put on a cage show. And that's scary. 
in terms of you know we've we've spoken to people you know like Paul McVeigh for example and you know he's he's under the impression that you know in Britain you'll never get a unified body because none of the promoters will sort of talk and and, and work with each other is that your view at the moment do you think that we're a long way from getting that governing body or are we closer than we've ever been <clears throat> I think I think there are things happening at the moment that will be a step in the right direction until we get government involved then I really really don't think that that is going to happen and, and, and Paul is, 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 is right because it's happened in kickboxing you see we need a governing body not a sanctioning body and that was the route that kickboxing went down they went down the sanctioning because that's all about money we need individuals who are here for the sport Okay, and I'm not saying that they don't have a right to make a living off that. What I'm saying is, is that they need to be almost uh, um, devoid from that. You know, you know, you put on your refereeing hat, and then when you take that off, you would then be a, a representative of the governing body, or you know, you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to go back to the past a little yeah, bit because 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 I, I, I think it's important you know the, the brawl in Albert Hall was the first time the UFC sort of decided they UFC were going to yes. uh, they were going to leave the American shores and they came to London and yeah. we know you had some involvement in that can you tell it again for the guys that don't know yet you know the UFC is the the, the mark it's the cornerstone of MMA yeah. at the moment um, how, how did that come about Dale Adams uh, started an association amusingly called Bama yeah. okay and <clears throat> I was the manager for Bama. I was the general manager for Bama. Um, the UFC came to, they all said, you know, you're doing good things. We want to sanction under you. Um, can you provide us with this, 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 and this? And Dale said, yes. Um, and that was how I got involved. Um, it was scary. <laughs> It was scary. I had to give uh, a press conference. Um, you know, uh, we, I had two guys from my gym, um, very well known now, Mark Collette, who works for the UFC, is a judge. Paul Sutherland, <coughs> who was also a UFC judge, but now runs Trojan, great fighter himself, British champion, etc., etc., etc. They did a demonstration um, in in the bar that we we had the the press conference in you know their photographs were in in the CERN and in the Daily Star and all of those things and, and it was great it was a great time um, <clears throat> it got a bit hairy uh, we did the press conference uh, then we went home and as I remember it was the Thursday I got a phone call I was actually ill in bed um, and I got a phone call from Dale saying to me that we need to get up to London now so I had to get out of bed, get dressed, drive to Bath, pick him up, and then we drove to London. Uh, the British government, in their wisdom, had called a meeting on the Friday with the intention of stopping UFC 38 happening on the Saturday. And they tried everything. They, they tried health and safety. Uh, the UFC, being the professionals that they are, turned around and went, OK, health and safety. Our cage has been in the country for three months. We've actually got it British kite marked. Um, the guy from the health and safety executive said it was the best bit of engineering he'd seen in a long time. They tried with the, pyro, uh, the, the, the technical of the lighting and all the rest of it and the, the pyrotechnics. Uh, they had two guys from Hollywood who were doing it. Um, the, the chief fire officer for Westminster said that, that, was, um, that these guys were far more qualified than he was to actually deal with that. Um, they, they tried uh, to tell me that there was a, a show that was banned in Chippenham um, and they were adamant, this is the British government, were adamant that this show had been banned and I sat there and, and I actually had to turn around and say well actually no, um, I can provide you with photographs of the Mayor of Chippenham presenting the British title belt with me stood next to him and the fighter with his hand raised. Uh, so you know they even tried the gloves you know, are these gloves legal, blah, 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 blah. It was a tense meeting, but it's history, and we prevailed at the end of the day, and so did, so did the UFC. How, going all the way back then, and how tight that was, are we now, what, 10 years later? And things have just kind of moored around a little bit, you think? Or do you was it just the UFC involvement to have everything cross-checked and double-checked? <coughs> I think what it was, was that the UFC is such a big show, 
it's huge and they they spend a lot of money on advertising uh, and they've got this massive promotional business that goes on and let's face it they set the standards they seriously do with their countdowns and everything else you know uh, they called press conferences they did this they did that they had Ian Freeman doing stuff Mark Weir doing stuff Lee Remedios was doing stuff and they were the three bridge fighters you know and, and you've got to remember that, that <clears throat> Ian Freeman beat up Frank Mir he beat him up Mark Weir knocked out Eugene Jackson in 11 seconds or whatever it was. It was brilliant for UK MMA and those guys never got the recognition. Mark Weir could walk into this room now, same as Lee Remedios, and nobody would know who, he, who they were, which is, I think is, is a travesty. Have things changed? Yes, they have. They've changed massively. But I think what happened back then was that if you say which is the biggest, most prestigious venue in our capital, Back then, I'm not talking about the old two. You would say London Albert, the, the Royal Albert Hall, yeah. and all of a sudden you've got this sport that has been deemed human cockfighting in our capital, in our most prestigious venue. You know, somebody was going to sit up and take notice, and they did, and we quelled all of the problems. Now, it was interesting because there were about nine people on the government side and then there was me <laughs> and the guy from Clear Channel, uh, the, the gentleman who owned it, and I've forgotten his name, Simon something, apologies, um, and we filled all of their questions and we were the only two people that were allowed into that room. Nobody else was allowed in. My uh, final question is, you work a lot, a lot of shows throughout the year, Mark, um, from you know, the very big promotions to the very small, but, but what do you see the differences are between those and the kind of gap between officials, um, basically I'm saying what advice could you give from those smaller medium shows to get to the level that they should be? Keep doing what they're doing. Just keep doing what you're doing. You have to build your brand. Otherwise you've got to have a lot of money to build that brand instantly and, and that's not an easy thing to do. Listen, I love working grassroots MMA. I, I just adore it. It, it. It's, you know, you see fighters coming through, and and it's, you know, really, really great. When you, I remember um, Paul Daly's first fight when he fought on Cage Warriors in in Portsmouth. That was his first fight. Uh, I look at him now. You know, the likes of Shay Mills. You know, I, I, I trained Shay for his first fight, and he fought on some little show in Western Supermare in a leisure centre in a ring. And look at him now. Look at all of these people that are growing and, and it's an honour and a privilege for me to referee these guys. It really, really is. And I love the fact that these guys are so dedicated. And that's what MMA has brought to martial arts in this country, I believe. It's torn it a new arsehole. Seriously. Because all of a sudden people are going, this stuff works. So why can't I do A, B and C? ninjas or whatever it is yeah. it it's it's brought the reality back to martial arts it's given martial arts a reality check it really really has and i love that do you think um, MMA gets the enough publicity or the white right publicity yet in the country uh no uh, yes what who doesn't are the fighters you see, to me, I'm a referee, right? And I don't care that nobody who knows who I am. I'm not really that bothered because that's the way it should be. They call him the third man. You shouldn't even notice the referee, all right? Because it's not about me. And there are some personalities out there that it is all about them. And to be quite honest with you, they, they do what they do. I'm not that bothered. Me, I get in there and as long as I do a good job and nobody knows who I am, I'm happy. And that's because it's about the fighters. I haven't trained for three months, lost a stone and a half, gone through misery with my missus because I'm grumpy and I can't eat properly and all of those things me I can go and have a burger now and still get in that cage and do my job they can't so there it's about them it's not about me and you feel that they deserve yes they deserve the publicity they you know look Shay Mills Shay Mills can walk through Gloucester and nobody knows who he is you know mm. uh, Jimmy Wallhead J Jimmy can walk around and, and nobody would know who he is yeah. you know Mike Tyson walks through the middle of Leicester He's going to get mobbed. 
it's it's about the fighters because they are this sport without the fighters they are the sport you know and then you've got the whole series of people behind them you've got the gyms you've got the promoters you've got the managers all of these guys do such a good job and look this is an ungoverned sport at the moment look how big it is and how well run it is because we self regulate and i think that's awesome my final question for you. Again, I'm not I'm not playing on your age or anything, but you're in a unique position where you've been involved from essentially the outset of MMA yes. in this country. Yeah. Um, what do we have to do other than the governing body? Because you very you spoke very strong about that. What do we have to do next as an MMA community to, in order to to push it forward? Is is there things that the fans or promoters? What can we do to make the sport grow more? Because I think that's why we all do it. I I think. I think that we need, there needs to be more communication and I think that, that that is happening but I would like to see more communication, you know, I, I would like to see promoters talking to each other, they do, you know, and, and I know that some promoters will say, right, you've got a show on that day so I'll do mine a week later, you know, um, I'd like there to be the promoters talking to each other because really they're the guys that provide the platform for these fighters you know and, and what worries me is sometimes you know you turn up and somebody will say i saw that guy fight last night that concerns me you know and with the right communication but again that comes back to a a, a governing a governing body sort of some kind of communities you say which would probably be governed by a governing body to listen in the states if the governing body, uh, if the athletic commission say no, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Do, you know, do you know what I mean? I mean, Alistair Overeem, all right, bless his cotton socks, who eats horse meat and gets huge, and then all of a sudden gets found that he's not actually not eating horse meat, he's actually taking uh, a performance enhancing drug. Okay, he's now outside of America doing regular drug tests because he wants to be back fighting in the UFC. The UFC didn't ban him, the athletic commissions did. And that is the power, and I think that once we get that, or get close to it, this sport will really, really take off in this country. Not that it hasn't, it's huge. It is huge, but We've it- We've got something that we can break everybody through. listens to. Yes. Break through um, the glass ceiling, I yeah. Think. yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, I, I got to tell you, whether or not we use this, but you, you're going to have a ton of stories. Is there one of them that you could share on, on interview? Your favorite MMA story? You know, something silly, something ridiculous, something we might not believe? Uh, You've got hundreds, I'm sure. I, uh, I refereed uh, um, Phil Norman, who won uh, Gladiators. And this this is really really amusing. I, I think it's really funny. And he was fighting. He's six foot two, six foot three. And and we always laugh about this. But he was fighting a little guy who was the same weight, but about five foot three, five foot four. Kid couldn't get anywhere near him. Phil was jabbing his head off, you know, doing what he wanted. And all of a sudden, this lad just out of desperation, I'm guessing, threw a spinning heel kick, caught Phil Norman flush on the jaw, laid him out cold. I dived in to save him, he came round and double legged me. So I went whoosh, right up and right the way down. And then he looked at me and he went, what are you doing down there? Very much the same as Elliot Elliot yes. in this very arena here. Uh, you know, I mean, yes, there, there are some, there's lots of funny things that have happened, you know, boxes have come out and people are sort of, you know, I've actually refereed female fighters whose breasts have fallen out and they've asked me to put them back in and, <laughs> and I'm like, do you know what, I'll do a gum shield but I'm not touching those, uh, you know, you need to get your, your corners to do that. Mark, I know you've, you've got to get ready for rules meetings and you're going to be doing probably eight or nine fights tonight. I want to thank you very much for My your pleasure. Time. My um, pleasure. Anytime. It's, it's been awesome. Thank yes, you very much. It's sir. been brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you.